what are some ways to maximize your singlehood? Okay, what are your dreams? What, what, what do you wish for in life? If, if, you could, if you could do or be anything you would want to do or be that would bring you joy and also bring God glory, you go for that thing. You don't, you don't sit around and, and wait for, for a mate to have that. You know, Adam got his mate while he was naming animals. He was maximizing this brilliance. You have to be brilliant to name every species of animals. He was using his brilliance. Uh, so that brilliance now comes through our knowledge, either by education or by experience. What do you want to learn about? What do you want to do? What do you want to be that you still have the capacity to pursue it? Don't stop. You go for it. Just make sure it, you know, your, out, your calling involves a number of things. First of all, it involves your passion. What, are, what, what sets your soul on fire? Secondly, it involves your gifts. What is your talent? Thirdly, it involves your experiences. What are the good, bad, and ugly things that have happened in your life that really has equipped you for something else, to benefit someone else? What is your personality like? When the writers of scripture all, all had different personalities, whether they were single or married, and you can tell who they were, you can tell a Peter book from a Paul writing because they had different personalities. Paul's this academic mind. He's a single guy. Peter says Paul is hard to understand because he's talking in such deep theological language because he had a different training. He was biblically trained. So, so those uniquenesses and differences are tied to our personality. Peter is a type A personality. He talks too much. You know, the boy wear peppermint socks the way he loved to keep his foot in his mouth. He just continually has something to say. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But he had a distinct personality, but God used that personality. So you don't have to become somebody else. And then you look for opportunities. And while you're doing that, you pray if, if it's the desire that the Lord brings you a mate, but you don't wait around being passive uh, while you're waiting for one. You, you go for it. And if your life is full then, and you're undivided, then you, you are now using your time, your talents, and your treasures to bless you, benefit others, and glorify God. That's good. One thing I got from that, if you talkative and you talk too much, don't worry about what people say. God can still use you. That's what I got. Uh, <laughs> hey. The Lord will use you. All right. Oh, no, that's good. Um, so how do you know when you are complete in Christ and ready for marriage? You are complete in Christ. Well, first of all, there's a position and a practice. The position, every believer is complete in Christ because every believer has been given a new nature. So the pos our position is in our new nature. Okay, we're body, soul, and spirit. The, when, when you get saved, your soul doesn't get saved, your spirit gets saved. Your soul is being saved. It's progressive sanctification. Your spirit is immediately saved. So that, that is a full transformation that occurs. So you are complete in Christ. The issue is now living that out, living the principle into the practice. So how do you know you're doing that? You're doing that when 1 Corinthians 10.31 becomes normative. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. When the God's glory becomes your normal modus operandi, you're functioning in your completeness in Christ and you're seeing more of Christ validate your completeness. But if you're, if you're sometimes for God's glory and other times not, then you're not, you're not exercising your completeness in Christ even though you possess it. 